so I know I don't need a microphone, but I was told to use it for the rec for the recording and whatnot. So, um, okay. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, Amen. Okay, so today we are going to begin studying the Book of Nehemiah. Uh, although it was written 2,500 years ago, there are many themes that resonate with today's reader. And it's a book that's filled with many spiritual lessons and contemplations. So let's begin by putting it into context. First, let's remind ourselves uh, the structure of the Old Testament and where the book of Nehemiah fits in. So the, the Old Testament, as you, can, as you might recall, is divided into, into five parts. Uh, the first is the book of the law, the books of the law, Genesis, Exodus, and so forth. The second is the books of history, and this is where we find Nehemiah. So these are uh, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, which I think we had uh, studied last time, uh, Nehemiah, and Esther. Uh, and then we have the books of poetry, and then the major and the minor prophets, okay? And um, according to the Jewish tradition, it was thought that 1st and 2nd Chronicles, as well as Ezra and, ne and Nehemiah, may have originally been one book in the original Hebrew language, and it's believed that the author was actually Ezra. Um, however, as you'll see, much of the book of Nehemiah is actually written in the first person, so it's believed that it's uh, quite possible that um, it, could have written, it could have been written together uh, with some collaboration from Nehemiah, or at least in part written by Nehemiah. Okay, now we're going to go through a brief history of, um, remind ourselves of where we are in the history of the Israelites. So we're going to start from the very, very beginning, okay, but well, we're going to go quick. This will only take a few minutes. Uh, so let's go all the way back to the beginning. So God created Adam and Eve, who fell and were banished from the Garden of Eden. Uh, they had many descendants. Eventually, all of them would become sinful, except for Noah, who was righteous in God's eyes. So then there was a great flood, as we know, and the earth was destroyed, but Noah and his family were spared. God then made a covenant with Noah to never again destroy the earth by flood, uh, and the sign of that covenant was a rainbow. Next, we enter into the age of the great patriarchs. So this is Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Jacob, as we know, was the father of the tw father of 12 sons who eventually become the tribes of Israel. Joseph, one of his sons, is sold into slavery, um, and um, he saves Jacob's house from famine by, relo by relocating them to Egypt. Uh, the Israelites live in Egypt for 400 years, the Egyptians become worried about the growing population, and so they enslave the Israelites. Moses then leads his people out of Egypt, and this is around 1500 BC. So we're going to start to use some dates now. So at the time where Moses led his people out, we're at about 1500 BC. As you know, the Israelites wander in the desert for 40 years. Then Moses takes them to the edge of the Promised Land. However, it's Joshua who leads the Israelites into the Promised Land. Okay, next begins the age of the judges, which spans about 400 years. Uh, for example, these are Deborah, uh, Gideon, Samson, and Samuel. And the judges are heroes that save the Israelites from their enemies and lead the people back to God. Next begins the age of the kings and the age of the prophets. The prophet Samuel, who, who's also the last judge, ordains uh, Saul as the first king. And after him, David is ordained the next king, and then Solomon. Solomon is the king who would build the original temple. And then after him, his son Reho Rehoabam is uh, ordained the next king. It's during his reign that the kingdom splits into two. Uh, the tribes of Judah and Benjamin in the south uh, are called Judah, and they continue to follow King Re Rehoabam. And the remaining 10 tribes of the north are called Israel, and they follow King Jer Jerobo Jeroboam. Uh, so the kingdom of Judah had mostly unrighteous kings, uh, but there were a few righteous ones. So for example, Jehoshaphat, uh, his, uh, Hezekiah, and Josiah were some of the good ones. However, the kingdom of Israel only had unrighteous kings. Okay? So now we're getting to the part uh, the, that's more pertinent to our time period. Uh, so because of the unfaithfulness of the people, God allows uh, both kingdoms to be destroyed. Although the age of the kings comes to an end, the age of the prophets uh, continues. So now in 721 BC, the kingdom of Israel, so the northern 10 tribes, are defeated by the Assyrians. Uh, the Assyrians' strategy for military occupation was assimilation. 
This is important because of what we're going to find out about Judah. But what they would do is they would destroy the fabric of the society that they conquered by, um, by bringing in people from surrounding nations to intermingle with them. Okay? Uh, the northern kingdom was never reestablished. And it's from this point onward that the Israelite people become known as the Jews because all that remained was the kingdom of Judah. Um, in 586 BC, so a couple hundred years later, the kingdom of Judah was defeated by the Babylonians, and this is under the rule of King Nebuchadnezzar. Their strategy for military occupation was different than the Assyrians. What they did was exile. So they would take the best and the brightest of the population, and they would exile them uh, to their homeland to, try to get the human capital, and then they would leave behind the poor and the weak. So, and we read about this in Kings uh, chapter 24. It says, Nebuchadnezzar's army uh, carried away all Jerusalem and all the officials uh, and all the officials and all the mighty men of valor, 10,000 captives and all the craftsmen and smiths, none remained except the poorest people of the land. Okay. Now, approximately 50 years after the Babylonian exile, so now we're, in, we're at 539 BC, the Persian emperor, empire under King Cyrus would defeat the Babylonians. This is important, uh, or sorry, approximately two decades, so that, and approximately two decades after that, the Persians would allow some of the Jews to return to Jerusalem. So this is important because King Cyrus came, and after beating the, the, the kingdom of the Babylonians, uh, he took over, and then he would allow some of the Israelites to return. Um, so the return from exile occurs in three waves, and we're just about at the end of the, of the his, historical part here. So the return from exile occurs in three waves. The first wave is, uh, the, is called Zerubbabel's Zira, return, um, uh, and this was 50,000 people in total, and they would only lay the foundation of the temple, and then they would go on to build their own homes. So then prophets were sent, including Haggai and Zechariah, to rebuke the people for doing this, for leaving the construction of the temple and working on their own homes. And then this led to the second wave. This is, uh, the return, this is called Ezra's return. So Ezra, as you probably know, is a scribe and a priest, and he led a spiritual reform, reform. He also led the completion of the temple construction, which took 22 years. Um, the third return is Nehemiah's return. So this is the context of the book that we're going to read. This occurs 12 years after Ezra's return, um, and he would uh, lead the rebuilding of the walls of Jerusalem. Okay. Now, more specifically regarding Nehemiah. So, Nehemiah was born in captivity, but captivity in Babylon or Persia uh, did not necessarily mean oppression. So, the Jews were able to hold good social positions. Uh, they, many of them were very affluent, and most importantly, they were free to practice the, the religion of Judaism. Um, the king at that time was Artaxerxes, uh, and he was the king of Xerxes, who was the king who took Esther as his wife decades earlier. So that's kind of how they all link together. Uh, the key point here is that Nehemiah it was part of the king's court. He was likely a trusted advisor and a confidant to the king, and he was likely affluent and in the upper echelon of society. Um, and as we will read in the book of Nehemiah, he leads the third and the final return to Jerusalem in 445 BC with the purpose of rebuilding the wall, which only by a miraculous way only takes 52 days to complete. Um, and he then rules as a very uh, good and righteous uh, governor for Judah for an, for an additional 12 years thereafter. Okay, we are done the historical part. I think that was, what's that? It was necessary, and we got through it quickly. <laughs> all right. So everybody's still awake? All, er <laughs> all right. So now let's begin with uh, the book of Nehemiah. So um, we'll do a verse-by-verse -verse contemplation. Forgive me, the way I was told to do it was to just go through it, so I'll kind of read it, and then we can kind of discuss it towards the end. Okay? Um, so let's start at verse 1. Okay? And then we follow someone. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, now it happened in the month of Chislev, in the 20th year, as I was in Susa in the citadel. Okay, so here the author is setting the stage. He provides time and place. So the month of Chislev, 
uh, is in the Jewish calendar corresponding to the months of November and December. So uh, this is important because chapter 2 begins in the month of Nisan. So Nisan corresponds to the months of March and April. So in chapter 2, we'll discuss the relevance of that. But basically, there's a time lapse between chapter, the ending of chapter 1 and the beginning of chapter 2, several months pass. And there's some significance and some contemplations that we can have with regards to that that I'm, I imagine will be discussed in chapter 2. Uh, but that's the importance of that. Next, he writes, in the 20th year. This refers to the 20th year of the reign of, the, of King Artaxerxes. So this provides the reader context in relation to chronology of events with respect to Ezra's return. Uh, because as it states in the book of Ezra, chapter 7, his return was in the seventh year of the king. Um, so then, by this time, the Israelites would have been in captivity for many decades. Nehemiah himself would have been born in captivity, and he would never have seen Jerusalem. Um, also by this time, two groups of Jews, as we earlier discussed, uh, already uh, th would have already returned to Jerusalem from exile, and by this time, there would have been likely tens of thousands of people in Jerusalem. So next, Nehemiah writes, I was in Susa. Susa was the capital of the Persian Empire, uh, and he says, uh, the citadel. The citadel refers to a fortified palace of the king, or in other words, this would be the place of the king's court. Okay? So let's go on to, to verse 2. That Hanani, one of my brothers, came with certain men from Judah, and I asked them concerning the Jews who escaped, who had survived the exile, and concerning them. So he says here, brother, um, he's likely refer, referring to a fellow countryman rather than a biological relative, such as a brother or a cousin. Um, as it can be assumed that Nehemiah was likely taken into captivity with his entire extended family. It's even quite possible that Nehemiah had no remaining blood relatives in Jerusalem. Nevertheless, as we'll see in the upcoming verses, this is not reflected in his affinity towards his home homeland and his compassion towards the plight of his people. We also see the term Jew being used here. It's important to note again that this was a new term that was used to describe a subset of Israelites. And this term only came into use after captivity. It was used specifically to refer to the captives from the southern kingdom of Judah. And as I, as I had mentioned earlier, by this time, the northern kingdom of Israel would have been completely assimilated into the neighboring areas through intermarriage, and they would eventually become what we know as the Samaritans. Okay, so a lot of this is kind of set, setting up the scene. Um, now verse 3. And they said to me, The remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame. The wall of Jerusalem is broken down, and its gates are destroyed by fire. So Hanania here is painting a very grim picture for the remaining people in Jerusalem. Remember that the remnant would have been made up of the poorest and the weakest of the people. Um, and as we discussed earlier, it was the military practice to exile the best of the human capital. Uh, so the remnant here would likely not have had the knowledge, uh, the ability, or the resources to rebuild Jerusalem. Um, and we know from the book of Ezra chapter 4 that there was an unsuccessful attempt already to rebuild the wall. And in fact, it was uh, the surrounding nations sent word to this very same king, King Artaxerxes, informing him of the attempt to build the wall. So this is in Ezra chapter 4, to build the wall. And Artaxerxes actually commands them to stop. Um, and as we'll see over the coming weeks, this is in sharp contrast to what will happen with Nehemiah. Also, uh, note that Hanani makes specific mention of the destruction of the wall and its gates. So the walls of Jerusalem are of central importance in the book of Nehemiah. Uh, and there's a lesson in here for us. So this is the first kind of lesson that we can, we can take. Um, but it requires us to understand the allegory of what Jerusalem represents. So Jerusalem is the city that houses the temple of God. And it's therefore an archetype for heaven, the dwelling place of God. But it's also an archetype for our hearts, which is the indwelling place of the Holy Spirit. When our Lord was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God would come, he answered them saying, the kingdom of God is not coming in ways that can be observed, nor will they say, look here, uh, look, it is here or there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. And as St. Paul said, or as St. Paul wrote, 
do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Thus, when we read about Jerusalem and its walls throughout the book, we should also meditate of the state of our own Jerusalem, of our own hearts. And we must also be mindful of the walls that we too need to erect in our lives in order to protect Jerusalem, our hearts from the enemy. Okay, let's go on to verse 4. As soon as I heard these words, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before God in heaven. So Nehemiah was filled with compassion for his kinsmen that he had never met, and for a place that he had never visited. This tells us that Nehemiah was faithful to God and to his people. There's a lesson in here for us as well, that though we might live in the world as Nehemiah lived in the courts of the king, yet we should not let the world live in us. And although Nehemiah served a pagan king, nothing superseded his faithfulness to God and his people. And the same should be true in our lives. Though we all have earthly responsibilities, nothing should supersede faithfulness to our God and his people, our church. Next, we read that as soon as I heard these words, meaning the very first thing that Nehemiah does, his very first response is to sit down and weep. Those are his words, to sit down and weep. He goes on to say that, that, uh, he, that his fasting and prayer continued for days. So then we see that Nehemiah's initial reaction was not to act at all but instead it was to pray. As the psalmist writes, be still and know that I am God. And as we learn from Elijah, the voice of God is often heard in a gentle whisper. The lesson here for us is to remember that in the midst of our troubles, instead of looking for an outward solution and relying on our own abilities, we should instead turn inwards, meet God in our hearts, and place our problems at his feet. This is what Nehemiah did. And as St. James writes, the prayer of a righteous man avails much. And as it says in the book of Proverbs, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make direct your path. Nehemiah also says that I mourned for days. So let's spend a moment contemplating on the power of tears. St. John Chrysostom wrote, Tears are the medicine for the soul, the grace of the Holy Spirit, a gift which when we possess, we know the preciousness of it. And St. Gregory of, of, of Nyssa succinctly put it this way, Tears are the symbol of the soul's desire to fly to his beloved. And in a book entitled How to Be a Sinner, uh, by a contemporary author, Peter Budinev, it states the following. Somehow, it's a very beautiful um, quote from it. Somehow, the distance between woundedness and joy is shorter than the distance from happiness to joy. These sentiments are all captured in what Nehemiah felt when hearing of the desolation of Jerusalem. And this too is how we should feel when we recognize the states of our own hearts when they are devastated by sin. Okay, let's go on to verse 5. All right. And I said, O Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps covenant and steadfast love with those who love him and keep his commandments. Okay, so now begins what is known and what is referred to as Nehemiah's prayer. And it serves as an excellent example for, uh, as an excellent model for prayer, um, that we can put into practice in our own lives. So what does Nehemiah do? He begins by remembering who God is to him and what God's covenants are. This is the basis of his relationship with God and the basis of his prayer. Nehemiah doesn't question God. He doesn't blame God, nor does he lose his faith. Instead, he reminds himself who God is to him. And in the liturgy of St. Basil, the opening stanza of this prayer has actually been adopted and is the opening line of, yeah, exactly, opening line of the prayer of the fraction. Okay, let's move on to verse 6. We're, we're, we're flying through it here. <laughs> verse 6. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open. So Nehemiah is continuing his prayer. 
Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant that now that I now pray before you day and night for the people of Israel, your servants. Confessing the sins of the people of Israel, which have sinned against you, even I and my father's house have sinned. We have acted very corruptly against you and have not kept the commandments, the statutes, and the rules that you commanded to your servant Moses. Okay, so next we see that Nehemiah prays for his brethren. And not only does he confess the sins of the people, but he takes responsibility himself as part of the guilty. Even though it was the infidelity of those who preceded him that resulted in the punishment of exile. He does not blame God for his situation, but instead he repents for his sin and on behalf of his people. Like Nehemiah, we too should have hearts inclined towards repentance. As the psalmist wrote, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is always before me. And as St. Paisios wrote, ask for repentance in prayer and nothing else, neither for divine light nor miracles nor prophecies nor spiritual gifts, nothing else but repentance. For repentance will bring humility and humility will bring the grace of God. Simply put, God wants our repentance because he loves us. He wants to give us rest. This is why Christ said, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And uh, he wants us to be in loving union with him. Uh, Abide in me and I in you is repeated so many times in the Gospel of St. John. And he will never reject us. The one who comes to me, I will know by cast out, says the Lord. And in the book of Ezekiel, it reads, I have no pleasure in the death of a sinner, but that the sinner may return and live. And in the book of Micah, it reads, he delights in mercy. All God wants is our broken hearts. As King David wrote, for you do not desire sacrifice or else I would have given it. You do not delight in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. The psalmist also beautifully writes, you have collected my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. I have read it, I've heard it said like this once. On the day of judgment, Christ will not ask me why I have sinned, but he will ask me why I have not repented. So next, we read that Nehemiah refers to himself as a servant. There are many commentaries about the character of Nehemiah as a model of a godly leader. But Christ teaches us that the idea of a godly leader is in a sense an oxymoron. God himself is the only true leader. And instead, Nehemiah says it more aptly. We are his servants. In the same spirit, St. Paul, uh, in the same spirit, St. Paul's letter to the Roman begins, Paul, a servant of our Lord Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. In fact, to view ourselves as leaders is in a way stealing leadership from God. This is reminiscent of when the Israelites asked God for a king, and when this displeased Samuel, the Lord responded, Obey the voice of the people in all that they say to you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me uh, from being king over them. Instead, a servant asks God to work through him or her, and as we see in many characters throughout the Bible, it's often in spite of their shortcomings that God works. As St. Paul wrote, his power is made perfect in our weakness. And our Lord Jesus Christ, the incarnate God himself, gives us the ultimate example of what it means to be a servant when he washed the feet of his apostles. And then he instructed them saying, if any one of you desires to be first, then he must be last of all and servant of all. And as St. Paul wrote, the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. This is often misconstrued as a call for male dominance or authority. But instead, it's a call to servitude. The key here is e even as Christ is the head of the church. And as we know, Christ loved us, the church, even unto death. And thus, the role of the husband as the head or the leader can be summed up in this way. It's his God-given duty, not his authority, to take the first step in the marriage when the first step might be a difficult one. 
This paradox of the greater serving the lesser is one of the many beautiful paradoxes that we find in our Christian faith. Next, Nehemiah says in that same verse, we're still on that same verse, he says, I pray before you day and night. This is reminiscent of St. Paul's call to pray without ceasing. But did, ne- but, did Nehemiah really, but did Nehemiah really mean that he prayed day and night? And did St. Paul really mean that we should pray without ceasing? Or is this just hyperbole or some literary device of sorts? And if it's not, how is it even possible? In his book, The Art of Prayer, St. Theophan the Recluse, a 19th century Russian Orthodox monk and bishop, addresses this very question. How can one pray without ceasing? Uh, for, for those who came in, we are on verse 6, but we're contemplating a little bit, so I'm, I'm going off on some tangents. <laughs> um, so let's go to where, where we... Um, Okay. Verse 6 of Nehemiah chapter 1. Okay. Okay. So we're, <laughs> we're on this point about praying without season. So to answer this question, St. Theophan examines the following instruction that our Lord gave. He, but when you pray, go into your closet and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees in secret will reward you openly. St. Theophan explains that the spiritual closet is the innermost room inside man himself, his heart, which is the dwelling place of God, the Holy Spirit within us. As St. Macarius once wrote, the heart is but a small vessel, and yet dragons and lions are there, and there are poisonous creatures in all the treasures of wickedness. Rough, uneven paths are there, and gaping chasms. But there likewise is God, There are the angels, there is life in the kingdom, there is light in the apostles, there are the heavenly cities and the treasures of grace. All things are there. So according to St. Theophan, it is here in the heart that one meets his, his or her maker. He goes on to define prayer as standing before God with the mind in the heart. Not the mind and the heart, but instead St. Theophan says, the mind in the heart. And this echoes what our Lord's uh, Lord's words when he instructs us to go into our closets. Our minds represent our conscious self, our thoughts, our feelings, our experiences, our desires, our anxieties, everything that makes us who we are. And our hearts represent the dwelling place of God within us. So then in is the operative word here. The heart is not merely an instrument that our feelings are born out of, but instead, the heart is the place where a person goes to meet God. And the message, and his message is once we have withdrawn inwards to meet him, that we do not leave. We need to strive to remain with him throughout our day there in our heart. This is how one can pray without ceasing. And this might be what our Lord meant when he instructed us to go into our room and shut the door. There are only two people in that room, God and me. And who do you think is the one that's most likely to leave? God or me? Of course, it's not our immutable God, but instead, it's me, enticed away by, enticed away by all the cares of the world. Thus, St. Theophan's message is that we should shut the door and that we don't leave. Thus, wherever we are, whatever we're doing, whoever we're with, having collected ourselves inside of our own hearts, we shut uh, ourselves inside and we pray in secret. This type of prayer might not even require a word, just him and me present together inside my heart. Thus, prayer is more about reaching inwards than about reaching outwards. It's more of an inclination towards God than an act that's directed towards him. And this type of spontaneous prayer can be done at any moment and even at every moment. And maybe uh, this is what St. Paul meant when he wrote, pray without ceasing. And maybe this is what Nehemiah meant when he said, I pray before you day and night. Okay, let's move on to verse 8. This is a a short chapter. We only have a few more verses to go. I think it's 11 verses or so. Um, Verse 8. 
Remember the word that you commanded your servant Moses, saying, If you are unfaithful, I will scatter the peoples. But if you return to me and keep my commandments and do them, though your outcasts are in the uttermost parts of heaven, from there I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen, to make my name dwell there. They are your servants and your people whom you have redeemed by the great power, by your great power and by your strong hand. So here, Nehemiah is remembering the stern warnings of Moses the prophet. In the book of Leviticus, Moses warned the people not to commit abominations, lest the land vomit them out. And in the book of Deuteronomy, before entering the promised land, Moses again warns the people that if they are unfaithful to God, they shall be plucked off of the land. But the key here is hope. Despite fasting, prayer, and weeping for several months, Nehemiah never falls into despair. He never loses hope. He relies on God's mercy and on his promises. The remembrance of God's promises becomes the source of his consolation. It even becomes his request. Nehemiah remembers what, remembers what God, God's words. I will gather them and bring them to the place that I have chosen. And this brings him comfort. Okay, let's go on to the next verse, verse 11. O Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight to fear your name and give success to your servant today and grant him mercy in the sight of this man. So finally, Nehemiah asks the Lord for success and for favor in the eyes of this man. This man, he's referring to King Artaxerxes, which we'll see in the next chapter he uh, is confronted with. This suggests that out of fasting and prayer, a plan has been born in Nehemiah's heart. There's a certain level of pragmatism and planning that we see in the character of Nehemiah that we can learn from as well. We too could apply pragmatism in our own spiritual, in our own spiritual lives to achieve growth and ultimately to achieve a deeper intimacy with God. But most importantly, Nehemiah trusts in the providence of God. As the prophet Jeremiah reminds us, who has spoken and it came to pass unless the Lord has not first commanded it? There is another important lesson in this for us, and that lesson is this. When we're confronted with an obstacle in our lives, there may be both a divine component and a human component involving in overcoming that obstacle. We leave the divine component to God. This is his part. But we mustn't ever neglect the human component. This is our part. In this way, by God's unique design, uh, we are given an opportunity to participate in his plan for our lives. This is why the Lord accepted the offering of the young boy with the five loaves and the two fish, this is why he allows the men to move away the rock from the tomb before he raised Lazarus. And this is why he accepts Nehemiah's plan. And this is also why the Lord accepts our offerings too. It's so that we may have a share and a blessing in his work. Okay. And that, that's the final verse and it ends with a few words. It says, Now I was a cupbearer to the king. For the reasons that we had already discussed earlier, the position of cupbearer carries with its significance, and it gives us a lot of insight into Nehemiah. I won't repeat that, but I wanted to spend these last couple of minutes with one final contemplation. Being a cupbearer must have meant that Nehemiah lived in the knowledge of his own death. So Nehemiah's primary role as the cupbearer was to taste the food and the drink of the king before he ate or drank it um, in order to curtail any assassination. So that means that every single day, Nehemiah was putting his life in mortal danger. And any day could have been his last. Living in the knowledge of his own death must have had an impact on his character and his faith. As St. Simeon, the new theologian, wrote, the man who loves God always has the memory of his death and judgment in his soul. And this thought inclines him to tears and to the burning flame of a heart that always contemplates divine realities. It could have been as if St. Simeon was writing this verse about Nehemiah himself. 
Maybe it's for this reason that, uh, that Nehemiah was inclined to fasting and prayer, weeping and repentance. And maybe it's for this reason that Nehemiah was a man of prayer and contemplation. And maybe it's for this reason that Nehemiah had the courage to see his plan through and would not hesitate to leave the comforts of the palace. And maybe this is the key for us to unlock Nehemiah's wisdom. As the psalmist writes, teach us to remember our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Glory be to God forever, amen. Okay, that's chapter one. <laughs> so, um, why don't we talk about it, all right? Um, I know the, the structure of uh, the Bible study this time was different, and I'm just doing it as I was told, so I kind of just gave more of a formal talk, and, and, and we'll see how that goes. But um, are there any questions about the chapter or any comments or contemplations uh, anybody wants to share? Anybody want to summarize the chapter for, for, uh, for our friends who came in a little late? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll summarize the chapter. So basically we're doing, uh, we started off with the book of Nehemiah. As you heard at the end there, Nehemiah was the king's cupbearer. Um, and um, Nehemiah was born in captivity. So this is um, the age when uh, the, the, ten, the ten tribes were destroyed and were gone by this time. Only the two remnant tribes of Judah remained. Um, and, and Nehemiah was born in captivity. Uh, and then this begins with um, one of his kin kinsmen, one of his countrymen coming. His name was Hanani. And Nehemiah asks him, how are the people? Tell me about the, the congregation. How are, how are they doing? And he paints a very grim picture for him. And his, the main point of the grim picture was the desolation of the walls and the gates of Jerusalem. By this time, Ezra had already led a spiritual form, and they had rebuilt the temple, but the walls were still in shambles. And then we talked about um, kind of the spiritual significance, the allegory in what Jerusalem means, and that Jerusalem is, uh, uh, Jerusalem is the place of the temple, which is the place where God resides, which is our hearts. That's how we should read Jerusalem. So, and then when we read about the walls that are destroyed and are in shambles, this must make us think about our own hearts when they're in desolation and destruction because of sin and about the walls that we need to erect around our hearts to protect them. These are kind of some of the things that we talked about. Um, and then um, I'm just talking again. I, <laughs> anybody else have any questions or contemplations or anything you want to share about the first chapter? Okay, let's, uh, let's pray. Henry, you want to lead us? Just in our, just in our Father.